Good morning and welcome everyone to St. George's here in Guelph this morning. Uh, it's nice again for the second week in a row, well technically the third because we did have a trial on the week before that, to have uh, people here in the church as we worship and also to all of you that we're connecting to on the live stream at home and who will be watching us later on, uh, as it's posted there and on YouTube. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Rafe Blackman. I serve as the rector here at St. George's. And um, today I want to introduce a few of the people that are part of the service with me. Um, we have a couple of people who are working back of house. Uh, and uh, and uh, Laura Keller, of course, has always been managing things for us. And David Good and, um, and Laura McDonald, one of our wardens, were there as well. Uh, Alexander Muth is here as our technician and he'll be the one watching the recording. And um, Megan Smith and James Walker are our soloists. Matthias Schmidt is our um, organist and keyboard player. And reading today is Shirley Stewart. So uh, thanks to all of them. Of course, thanks to Tony Atia who does all the cleaning for us and he's in the building as well. And not in the building, but in the building in presence are, are Elizabeth and George Adams because they've been doing the flowers for us lately. Um, they're in Ottawa today, but uh, we've now gone to planted flowers, so they'll be able to last for a little while because the frosts are kicking in at their farm, and that messes everything up, as you know. So thanks to them for doing that. For those of you who are here, remember I will bring communion to you at the right time, and I'll remind you about that. And, um, and all the other instructions are in your bulletins for you, when to stand or sit, and we'll do church as best we can uh, with the new provisions that we have. We wish to acknowledge that we meet on land that at the time of contact was held by the Attawaterim as an area of trade and ceremony by the two rivers. At various times, the land was occupied by both the Haudenosaunee from the south and the Anishinaabe from the north. In more recent times, the Huron Treaty gave rights to the Mississaugas of new credit. May we who dwell on or visit this land also be good stewards and honor those who came before us. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds as we're gathered here in the presence of God to worship.
The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O oh God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. I invite you to join with me as we pray the collect for this day. Holy God, you have built your church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Join us together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may become a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to sit as we listen for the word of God. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I have, these I have come to regard as a loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ Jesus Christ. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he said, sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is an heir come. Let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce of the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing. And it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him. But they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, as always, I speak to you in the name of the one who is our hope and salvation, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So we've been in Matthew for some time. We continue in Matthew's Gospel for weeks to come, with some interruptions, like for Harvest, uh, Thanksgiving, next week. Uh, but today we have uh, this parable, which is actually an allegory. But before I get there to unpack it, I want to tell you what's been going on, because this is a very frenetic, filling time of Jesus' life that's being recorded in Matthew. It's all in chapter 21, and it starts at the beginning of the chapter with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In he comes on the donkey, like the Maccabean kings of old, they're strewing things in his path, hailing him, Hosanna in the highest, the son of David, all that glorious entry. And then he goes from there to the temple. And the first thing he does in the temple is he confronts the injustices that he sees and the power that's misguided power by overturning the, uh, the, 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 the um, money changers tables and he cleanses the temple. Now, this isn't about not supporting the temple. This is not about not supporting the church and its mission. This is about what was going on. People were making money off of having to convert Roman coins to temple coins. They were bartering and, and charging, in essence, for the offerings that were held up to God for the purity of God's people. And the challenge here is an affront to the system of the, what had become in that religious system, one of commerce, one of profit, one of greed. And Jesus says, that's not what it's about. This is my Father's house. It is a place of prayer. It is a place for all people. No one will be turned away. And that is a direct challenge down through the time, even to us. So that's the first day he comes into Jerusalem. 
And then he heals some people in a temple, and all the religious authorities get very upset about that, and then he leaves Jerusalem to Bethany, which is not far outside Jerusalem for the night. And then on the way in, the next day he's hungry, there's a fig tree beside the road, and he goes over to get fig, there's no figs in it, and so he has it withered to the ground. Which seems like a very sad thing to do. Was it even the season for figs, one asks? But the point there is really, again, um, in, in metaphor, in parable, and it's a call to us that we must bear the fruits of that which we represent. A fig tree should have figs. The people of God should have the gifts and the symbols of God in their lives. And then his, quest, his authorities are questioned again in the temple by the religious authorities, and they say, by what do you do this? What gives you authority? We know why we have authority. We're the religious elite. And so he challenges them by asking the question about John the Baptist, who they put to death. And they don't want to touch that one, because they answer one way, they're going to be in trouble with the people. They answer another way, they're going to say that uh, they shouldn't have put John to death. And so they say, well, we're not going to answer that, we can't answer that. And Jesus says, well, I'm not going to answer you then by what authority I do these things. Again, a direct challenge to power and authority, standing up to the injustices of what power can become, even in the community of faith. Speaking truth to power is what we'd say in our day. And then there's this parable of two sons, a simple little parable that he tells. And it's about the two who are asked by their father to go and work in, in, the, in the vineyard, to go and work um, on the farm. And one of them says, sure, I'll go, and they never go. And the other one says, no, I don't have time for that, but eventually uh, recants and repents of that and does go. And the question there is, who actually did the will of the father? And it's not the one who said they would and didn't, but the one who said they weren't going to, but then finally said, no, I must do that. And this is about uh, form and substance, and we still have that problem even in our faith today. There's a lot of people who talk faith. What do they do? And there's a lot of people who question their faith, but in the end, they actually do the things that are incredibly faithful to do, like loving their neighbor, and supporting those who are in need, and reaching out. And we need to see how God is working through those places. All of this is an affront to the religious authorities. And that's what brings us to this powerful parable today, which is really an allegory. And it's the one of the, the landowner who planted the vineyard, left it in the care of those who were supposed to care for it, then sent other servants to come and collect at time what was due. Then they put them to death and beat them, and they did all those things to ignore them. And finally, the owner sends their son. And they say, great, this is the son. If we put him to death, we can inherit this whole thing. And it's ours. So what does the allegory stand for? Well, in an allegory, everything is representative of something else. So the landowner represents God. The vineyard is the land of Israel. The tenant farmers are the religious leaders of Israel. The slaves and the servants who come are the prophets and those whom God has sent to correct God's people throughout the time and ages. The Son, of course, is Jesus, who comes and lays down his life. And the new inheritors has been interpreted by the church to be the church. But we have to be very careful with that interpretation because it's led to much anti-Semitism throughout the history of the church. That's all it's about. Jesus is speaking to the power and the elite as a Jew within Judaism. And what he was saying is it's upside down and you need to repent. And the religious authorities heard that. They wanted to arrest him, they wanted to condemn him for it, and eventually they did, but not on this day because they were too frightened of the crowds. So this is really about authority and leadership. And it's authority and leadership even in the church and our call that we need to reevaluate, repent sometimes of things we've done. We know that in our church. We know that with our history with residential schools. We know that with our growing history of working with indigenous communities and trying to recapture a church within a church that is faithful and true. We also need to know that in the way we hold things. And this pandemic has really offered us a way to look at what does church mean? What's really important? We've lost choirs. I miss choirs. We've lost processions. I miss processions. But ultimately, they aren't the church. 
The church is the mission of compassion and care and prayer and giving our lives over that Christ may be more and we may be less. That we may, as followers in the way, display those things that are fully of God. It's so tempting to say this is ours. It's so tempting to say this is the right way to do things. I've been in so many arguments that way, particularly as a master of ceremonies in many dioceses that I was planning for services, and this is the right way that you have to do it. And I go, really? For a time's time, it's been the right way, but it hasn't always been the right way. And if we get caught up in the details, if we get caught up in the form, we lose the substance of our being. And we always have to center into the substance. So now, yeah, we're losing a lot of the trappings. We can't pass the peace like we used to do. We can't do the really great Anglican liturgy of cookies and coffee. We can't do the things that we knew and loved. But that's never been what it's about. What is true and always and constant is God's love of us and our call to live in compassion and care the best we can in all circumstances to be that love into this desperate world with so much brokenness, so much hurt, so much confusion, and say, yes, God does love and God does know and God does care and we are here to walk the journey. So maybe at the end of this, the church will look very different. I don't know how much longer we can hold on to a full-time clergy. We're already losing that in many places. We've been on a decline for a long time. I don't know how we'll organize ourselves, but if we work to always save the institution and save the structures, we can lose the substance of our being. And the substance of our being is to be followers in the way with Jesus. So I catch myself out sometimes. I say, at my church, but this is not my church. This is the church where I serve. The bishop said to me once, of course it's not your church, it's mine. But no, bishop, it's not even your church, I said to her. Ultimately, this belongs to God. And we, particularly as leaders, have to become humble enough to know that we serve. And it's not our inheritance, and it's not our prize. It's the place where we work out our duty our way, our following of Jesus into the world. Amen.
I invite you to remain seated or to stand as you are most comfortable for prayer. My friends, let us pray with unwavering firmness, with hearts of compassion, as we offer our petitions for all in need, saying, Gracious God, hear our prayer. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Let's pray for our world, with all of its struggles, all of the things that are challenges before us and opportunities for transformation. For those affected by this pandemic in so many ways, for those who have lost loved ones, those who are sick, those who are working hard to alleviate the pain that it's causing. Let us pray as well for those places that are in times of election and decision making, those places that are in turmoil, places where there is violence, brokenness, disregard for other human life, where there is abuse, neglect, where there is inequity and brokenness, where there is rampant racism. Let's pray for all of those situations in our world as we pray for all the peoples of the earth, the children of God, the members of this human family. Gracious God, hear our prayer. And let us pray for the mission of the church throughout the world, the mission to proclaim hope, to proclaim the good news in Christ, to proclaim compassion and healing and grace. And this week in particular, we pray for the work of our Anglican Worldwide Communion, centering on the Anglican Church in Tanzania. And here in the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for our leadership, for Linda, our primate, Mark, our National Indigenous Archbishop, Anne, our Metropolitan Archbishop. And within our diocese, we pray for Bishop Susan and the people of St. John's Church in Jordan. We pray for our ministries that we are still trying to uphold and perform from St. George's to be compassionate and care for those in our community. And as we have started again, we are praying through the cycle of our parish list. And today, we remember these from our parish family. Rosemary Anderson, Sylvia Anderson, Carol Annual, Paul and Becky Aspinall, and Emily and Jessica, Curtis and Katie Archibald, and Jacob and Ben, Dan Atkins and Susan Rintoul, and Nora and James, Jim and Eileen Atkins, Sybil Boston, Benjamin Ayan Badejo, and Don and Jane Bennett. As we remember the church and these of our church before God, we say, Gracious God, hear our at this time of moving towards Thanksgiving, this time where we're firmly in our part of the world in harvest and reaping the benefits of the good earth, let us pray for this earth, that we may be vigilant stewards of its resources. Let us pray for all that God has created, for the birds of the air, for the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea, and all the things contained in this wonderful place that we call our island home. And let us say, Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for those whose lives are marked by sickness, suffering, destruction, violence, strife, contention, for those who are victims of abuse, those who are victims of addiction, those who live on the margins, forgotten, those who are hungry, those who are homeless. We pray for those struggling from our community for whom we've been asked to pray. We pray for those who are in hospital today, for Shirley Spinarski and Dave Pocock, and any others that you may wish to name before God in the silence of your hearts or alive. And we remember those who have asked for prayers for special needs, for Ron, Trevor, Ray, Fred, Doug, Allison, Ted, Pat, Carol, Ina, Sago, Diane, Joanne, 
Ned, Rod, Jim, Vivian, Jim, Andy, Mac, Kate, John, Joyce, and any others that you would wish to name now before God or aloud or in the silence of your heart. We lift all these to God as we say, Gracious God, hear our prayer. And we pray for those who have died in the peace of Christ, for all the departed, and especially for these we now name. Murray Cool, Shirley Henshaw, Jim Jorgas, that they may rest in peace, and that their families and friends who grieve their loss may find comfort in the love and healing grace of Christ. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Lifting our voices with all creation, with those who have been blessings in our lives and shown us the way and strengthened us by their examples and their prayers, let us pray to God, saying, Gracious God, hear our prayer. Holy God, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, you give us a spirit of love and self-discipline. Hear our prayers for mercy and guard your people in times of trial. By the grace of your spirit, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. We come now to the time where we share the peace, but remember it's a contactless peace for those of you who are here. So we nod to each other and do the nasty thing you can do whatever you want to do um, but if they're not in your in your close circle we don't touch those at home you can send greetings to one another during this time as we share God's peace dear friends in Christ both here and out in the world the peace of the Lord be always with you We come now to the time where we uh, pray the prayer over the gifts. Uh, and just a word so that people know, uh, the gifts we offer are the gifts of ourselves, the gifts that God returns to us. And also we, we usually bring up and offer the gifts of our support of the church at this time. Um, we're not doing that because it's not part of our protocols, although we are receiving people's gifts and we're thankful for that for those who are in attendance here and those that give regularly on PAG. But those who are at home, if you find this useful, you can always support us in your ministries as well. Um, particularly if you're new to us, just go to our website and there's information there about how you can support us in our ministries. So as we offer ourselves the gifts that God has given us, the gifts that God will return to us, let us pray the prayer over the gifts together. God of truth, receive all we offer you this day. Make us worthy servants strong to follow in the pattern of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God our Creator. Eternal God. 
source of all being. We give you thanks and praise for your faithful love. You call us into friendship with you and one another to be your holy people, a sign of your presence in the world. When those we trust betray us, unfailingly you remain with us. When we injure others, you confront us in your love and call us to the paths of righteousness. You stand with the weak and those broken and alone, whom you have always welcomed home, making the first last and the last first. Therefore we raise our voices with angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O Holy One, when Hagar was driven into the wilderness, you followed her and gave her hope. When Joseph was sold into bondage, you turned malice to your people's good. When you called Israel out of slavery, you brought them through the wilderness into the promised land. When your people were taken into exile, you wept with them by the river of Babylon and carried them home. At the right time, you sent your anointed one to stand with the poor, the outcast, and the oppressed. Jesus touched lepers and the sick and healed them. He accepted water from a woman of Samaria and offered her the water of new life. Jesus knew the desolation of the cross and opened the way for all humanity into the redemption of your reconciling love. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus at supper with his friends took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Loving and Holy One, recalling Christ's death and resurrection, we offer you these gifts, longing for the bread of tomorrow and the wine of the age to come. Therefore, we proclaim our hope. Dying, we destroyed our death. Rising, we restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Pour out your Spirit on these gifts, that through them you may sustain us in our hunger for your peace. We hold before you all whose lives are marked by suffering, our sisters and our brothers. When we are broken and cast aside, embrace us in your love. Restore us, O God, let your face shine. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O source of life, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on the earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. I am the bread which has come down from heaven, says the Lord. Give us this bread for our bread. I am the vine, you are the branches. May we dwell in Christ as Christ lives in us. To those who are here, I will bring communion to you. And in a moment, uh, you may sit and wait till I get to you. Remember uh, not to uh, remove your mask until I move away and then you can have the communion. To those of you who are at home, we invite you to join us spiritually and um, in this moment, wherever you may be, to receive Christ in communion with the saints and the gathering of God's people, unseen yet present, with us now, for many are made one. If you've downloaded it, there's a prayer that you can use 
for your spiritual communion at home. Again, I will come to those who are here. If you don't want to receive communion, just stay seated and go like this, and I'll know you don't want to receive communion. Dear friends in Christ, these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
And we continue in prayer with our prayers after communion. Let us pray. Holy God, may we who have been strengthened by this Eucharist remain in your steadfast love and show in our lives the saving mystery that we celebrate. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may sit for this hymn.